of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we recognize the Trinity in our worship, that God is one God in three persons, manifesting himself in ways to save us and love us and comfort us. It is with the fullness of God that we um, find our blessing. But the fullness of God also reflects our own unworthiness. So we begin by acknowledging our sin and asking for God's forgiveness. Let's do so. Merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in our thinking, in our speaking, and in our actions. We often take credit for ourselves for what you have provided for us. Our jobs, food, shelter, clothing, all we need to support life. We act as if we have little sin that really needs forgiving. Or we believe we have to work out our own salvation. We do not deserve to be called your children. But putting our trust in the Holy Spirit to bring us to faith, we beg your forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And joining with King David in repentance, the tax collector in the temple, and, and the young prophet Isaiah, all we can say is, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. God is merciful. In his abundant compassion and love, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for us in our place, becoming human so he could do so. So our sins are forgiven. Not because of anything we've done, but because of everything God has done. So walk in newness of life. Your sins are forgiven. You have plenty to rejoice. Go in peace. The first lesson for this Trinity Sunday is actually Psalm 8. A wonderful praise of God for creation, including humanity. <clears throat> Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory is sung above the heavens. Out of the mouths of little children and infants, you have built a fortress against your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars that you have put in place, what are human beings that you remember them or mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them just a little lower than yourself. You've crowned them with glory and honor. You've let them rule over all you have created. You put everything under their control, all the sheep and cattle, the wild animals, the birds, the fish, whatever swims in the currents of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The second lesson comes from Paul's letter, the second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 13, verses 11 to 13, his kind of concluding remarks from a very painful letter. Dear brothers and sisters, let me close my letter with these words. Rejoice. Change your ways. Encourage one another. Live in harmony and peace, and the God of peace will be with you. Greet one another with holy love. All the saints here send you their greetings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Finally, the gospel or Jesus' last words in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, also known as the Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these words be yours and bless. Amen. This past week has been a very eventful one for me. I went to Montana to do a wedding of a, of a girl that I've known virtually her entire life to a very nice gentleman in Montana, and also combine it with a sis visit to my sister and her family that I hadn't seen in a couple of years. 
And it was nice, relaxing, beautiful. Until I started to feel some sort of thing going on in my heart and I went to have it checked. And I wound up in the hospital a couple of days. Barrage of tests, chest x-rays, blood work, EKGs, even a heart catheterization. And, and, and finally they said, okay, you can go now, but I still have the same symptoms. Now that kind of thing really makes you prone to some deep thoughts about life and death. <laughs> but, you know, life goes on. And my life goes on. But, but I started thinking about that with Jesus' life and death. And, 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 and I don't want to focus on that experience, but what it compelled me to wonder about, the Incarnation. When I realized that, you know, I had a couple of days now just to put a sermon together, I was struggling with it and so wanted to share my reflections on the incarnation. Yeah. God becoming human in Christ Jesus. How important that is. Trinity Sunday. We, we, so one day of the year, we say the Athanasian Creed, that long, detailed, redundant, and uncompromising two-page, three-page thing. And yet, it's absolutely true what it says. It's what we believe. However, I've just never been that crazy about its ending. Where it says that it's what you've done that determines whether you receive eternal life or everlasting fire. That you must believe all this or you cannot be saved. So in our church services, they, I'm sparing you that whole thing, but in our church services, we've moved that Athanasian Creed to the beginning to actually incorporate that idea and follow it up with an uplifting song about him about what God has done. Because it's really not about what we believe or, or, or do that saves us, but all about what God has done for us in his grace. In Christ, he paid the cost of our sin by dying on a cross in our place, which meant that he first had to become human in order to die which is what makes the incarnation so important to us. And so to that end, this isn't really much of a sermon, I want to share some of my reflections on that, what I had this past week, a few metaphors that came to my mind swirling around about God taking on our flesh. So, <laughs> for better or for worse, here goes. The basis of the incarnation is really stems from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I love how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. Yeah, moved in, but not welcomed. He didn't belong. Never did. While I was with my sister, we binge-watched this, uh, this, this series on the History Channel called Alone. And in it, there were ten guys that were dropped in the, the farthest north part of Vancouver Island. And they had to make it and survive as long as they could. They had a few minimum articles to take that they could take to help preserve their lives, but also a case with a cameras that they could photograph and record everything, their musings and what they did, meaning there wasn't a crew around to see it. They were entirely on their own, no contact with anyone else. Now the winner, whoever lasted longer of these 10, would win $500,000. But because you never had a contact with anyone, you never knew how you were doing in comparison to others. You never knew how long you'd have to be there. And so we watch them as they film themselves making shelter, scrounging for food, enduring the horrible weather they seem to have, and warding off predators like bears and cougars that could actually kill them. Now half of the contestants tapped out in the first two days. But those who lasted the longest, they had two things in common. They embraced this hostile environment for all its limitations and tried to make the best of that environment. 
And they also were in constant contact in their minds with their families, talking to them and bringing up stories to them, even though they were just recording in cameras in this wilderness. The eventual winner, who did last the longest, when they came to get him, he didn't really celebrate. It was just, oh, okay. And they showed him at home with his family, and he just seemed to be going on. But I wonder how much PTSD happened after that for him and all the ones that were there. It was that tough. So here's my, my first reflection. Having watched that, I figured we cannot, as human beings, comprehend how much God gave up to become like us. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul uses this early Christian hymn that begins how Christ emptied himself to become human. <laughs> emptied himself, poured himself out as a sacrifice, as an offering. And the only thing that kept Jesus going was his relationship with his Father in prayer. And in the end, in the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane, even that would be taken away. But still he embraced it. For us and for our salvation, according to another creed. That's what I kept reflecting on. A second reflection, inquiring minds should want to know. On the flight from Seattle to Great Falls, the lady across the aisle from me had a lot of tattoos. Now, that's not really the unique these days, but, but it was an array of color all over most of her body that you could see. Now, I've always only looked rather surreptitiously at other people's tattoos, almost treating them as if they're, they're scars, that proper decorum dictates you don't mention or, or actually act like you notice them. And I'm not sure why that is. I mean, tattoos are called body art for a reason. They're meant to be seen, meaning that each tattoo has its own meaning, its own story behind it. Now, what intrigued me is on her left arm, this lady had this cross section of a hill. And on the top of it was a cross that was broken and battered and looked weathered and weary. But underneath, there was this intricate root structure. And so something came over me, and I just leaned across and asked her, you know, can you explain what this means? And, and, and she did. She told me readily that this is her, her support thing, that she knows whenever those times when her faith that she has in God seems to weaken and crumble, she knows she has a good root system and it will grow back. I mean, wow, you want to talk about being marked by the cross of Christ? What a witness to me. She went on to share the meaning with a couple other tattoos, including some that I couldn't even see, and seemed really happy to do so. Now, I say all this because one of my mantras as a pastor has always taken from 1 Peter and that, that doing evangelism isn't making a sale, like trying to force Christ on somebody. The proper evangelism is, as Peter says, answering a question, accounting for the hope within you with gentleness and reverence. Now, I've always done that and seen that simply from the perspective of the one being asked, that we do things and say things that will make people ask us. But after that flight, I started thinking that we should be just as eager to do the asking. That when we see someone doing something, sharing something, wearing something, even if it's a tattoo, to ask about it. That was another thing I was reflecting on. Third reflection, it came from a book I was reading at the time by my, my doctoral mentor, Leonard Sweet. There's a comment in there, it just said, the disciples of Jesus are whales. And I, what does that mean? Well, he goes on to elaborate that whales are mammals that live in one world, but breathe the air of another. Like whales, we live in the world of the here and now but we receive life from the other. A couple of Sundays ago during Kids Talk, we were talking about the ascension of Jesus and I gave an idea of the gravity of our own human situation with a, a bouncing ball and I threw it up in the air and said, that's the principle, what goes up must come down. And yeah, 
But then I had a helium balloon as well. And I said, Jesus shows us that the opposite is true, that what goes down will go up, both for him and for us. That's what we have to look forward to, kind of as whales. We should be in, but not of this world. In it physically, but our spirit is with Christ. Thus, what we are in right now, we know is not all there is. Now, a fish cannot distinguish, describe what water is, because it can't distinguish it from anything else. It's all around it. It knows nothing else. But whales, dolphins and orcas too, they do know there's something more. A whole other world. And they regularly surface for inspiration. Literally, inspiration. Just as we should long for every single breath from heaven. So yeah, the disciples of Jesus are whales. And we should, pardon me, all rejoice in having a porpoise-driven life. I reflected on that. Final reflection, may we be the reflection. Back to the wedding between Alex and Jen. You know, I've done plus or minus 350 of those weddings in my ministerial career. But this one was truly unique. It was the first one I've done where nobody that was there lived anywhere close to the locale. The nearest people came from 250 miles away to Kalispell from Cheney, Washington. But we all went to this town in Montana for this wedding. We came, we decorated the place, we rehearsed the ceremony, we celebrated and danced, cleaned up, and then we all went home. Do not think of the incarnation that way. That Jesus was a one and done kind of thing, floating off into space 2,000 years ago. No, he did not leave us. In the gospel lesson, he tells his disciples, I am with you always. To the very end of the age. And so sure, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, but he is also always in our midst. He promises wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am with you. And I'm thinking that that's true, but a deeper understanding of that truth is that sometimes, maybe more often than we realize, we witness that. And our witness of his manifestation among us becomes a testimony to his withness to us. So my my final reflection is more of a prayer. That we, each of us, have moments where we are a reflection of his continuing presence. You know, just as the moon reflects the light of the sun when the earth is is shrouded at night, we too should shine as Christ's own incarnation in and through us when it's dark for some people. You know, every now and then some little kid will will say, you know, wow, and confuse me saying, you must be Jesus. And I think it's because I wear robes or act really differently and I'm charged of the chair. But but it's, it's not. It's a mistake. But yet, It shouldn't be restricted to me. There should be other people mistaken for Jesus at times in your life. Others, and you know who you are, who have those times where you are seen as Christ operating among them. We have people that do that with the local elementary school, with Habitat for Humanity, with the Outpost, with with Meals on Wheels, with with homeless and hungry and, and cat lovers all over. Yeah, you know... As they do what they do, in the midst of a broken world bringing healing and hope, that it is sometimes Christ seen doing that through them. What an honor that is. Those moments when he's seen incarnate in us. Those are are my reflections. It's not really much of a sermon, just sort of a piecemeal thing putting together. But in a sense, it comes out of this eventful week of wondering how Christ is present in me, in you, in all of us. The early church had this phrase to describe it, vestigia trinitatis, footprints 
of the Trinity. God's presence in the mundane, the arcane, the humane, making a difference in the world. Whatever brings wellness and wholeness to the people around us. So, oh, how wonder if it would be for us to leave plenty of those kind of footprints of the Trinity for others to follow. May God enable you so to do. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts, your minds, in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Planted deep in the soil of the Spirit, let us offer our prayers up to a God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who knows our needs even before we ask. But we pray anyway. Let's do so. O triune God, the fullness of your identity is a mystery, and yet you reveal to your church your awesome presence in many different ways. Teach us to worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Be with all those who uh, care for the world, the environment. As the psalmist says, how we were put in charge in that way. Make us sensitive to the ways in which we can preserve our natural resources for the good of all. Bring peace to those places where hostility reigns. Ukraine, Sudan, and even the Holy Land. May they work for peace and love of one another. May they work with your spirit. We ask, O oh Lord, that you draw near to all those whose bodies and existence know pain and illness, especially those we think about right here, right now, and lift up to you. Assure them of your abiding presence with them and grant them healing and understanding, hope and compassion for others. We ask you to guide the work of all the people in this congregation, all the people who listen and watch this as well, that you uh, manifest yourself in their actions of love and light in the world. May they bring beauty to suffering. May they be vanguards of your promise to come again. And holy are you, O oh God. You've made us your holy people as well. Keep us united with all those who we miss, who passed away living a life of faith and dwell with you now. All those who've gone before us and who now make their home with you. May they inspire us to treat one another as holy people. Hear us, we pray, O oh Lord, both orally and the silence in our hearts that uh, in your mercy... You give us all the good things for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who also gave us these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go forth then with the Lord's benediction, his blessing upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. That's our worship service for this week. I'm glad to be here to be a part of it. I'm glad you're watching as well. We have a bunch of things coming up, pretty, cert pretty sure and, and certain. Um, we need volunteers for our summer kickoff, June 17th. All sorts of different things to help with, with kids and stuff, kitchen stuff, works, volunteers. Sign-up sheet or check our website or call the office if you want to be a part of that. I want to remind you that we have our, our next... This is a new summer, and we'll have summer gatherings. The first one is until the 26th, so Monday at the end of the month. But I want to kind of prime the pump and make sure you realize that. Um, Outpost will be taken care of next week, so we'll have some, some volunteers on the list to be a part of that. And, and again, the Habitat's still building, and there's still opportunities to be a part of doing stuff with that. Um, in the midst of all the stuff going on, take a few moments, so well, to see how you can actually be the incarnation of Jesus in a moment in time.
that as we see Christ's face and all those around us, may those around us see him in us. God bless you in that regard.